This is a Geek Leader Podcast, and I'm your host, John Rauta. This show is all about helping us grow as leaders, become better technologists, and improve our lives both at work and at home. I hope you enjoy the show and learn a lot. Hello, world, and welcome to episode 244 of the Geek Leader Podcast. I'm your host, John Rauta, and it's been a couple of weeks since I published an episode, and that's because I had a pretty significant knee injury, and I was throwing a front kick, um, a jumping front kick, and I landed incorrectly and tore my ACL, sprained my, men- uh, my MCL, tore my meniscus in a couple of places, and had some hairline fractures in my tibia and fibia, so had to be out a little bit and get some surgery, but I'm recovering well, and uh, we're going to start having... Um, back to regular episodes and hopefully you guys uh, didn't miss too much and we'll get back on with our normal uh, way of life and normal podcast so uh, sorry about that and thanks for sticking around today's sponsor is a2 hosting i've been using a2 hosting solid state hosting solutions for our website at geekleader.com for many many years now and absolutely love their support their service and all the features that you get you get access to cpanel you get all of the things that you can imagine for a great wordpress experience including their a2 optimized wordpress which does extra security checks extra lockdown it you can lock down your editor uh, file so you can't edit anything inside there you get alerts whenever there are file changes that are done um, you can also do automatic updates backups and more with a2 hosting so highly recommend it Go to geekleader.com slash A2 to get more information and to sign up for their solid-state turbocharged speed hosting today. Again, that's geekleader.com slash A2. All right, Geek Leaders, today on the show, I've got Summit Gupta, and he is the founder of Deploy Yourself, and he started out just like us, being geeks and uh, getting into technology, working for several of the uh, prominent technology firms like Yahoo, Yahoo. Um, and not only that, he has also co-founded some nonprofits, which we'll talk about as we get going. Um, but he learned that leadership is kind of one of those things that you have to develop and learn in some of those, what they call soft skills, which I like to think of them as hard skills because they're kind of hard to do sometimes, are developed over time. It's not necessarily something that you're born with. And we're going to talk about that today. And with all that being said, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you, John, for having me. If you don't mind, just tell the audience a little bit about how you got to where you are today and what, uh, what it is that you guys are working on. Yeah. Yeah, so it's it's a very interesting story because I started out uh, as a geek uh, who was very good with computers and very bad with people. So that's how I used to call myself that. Give me computers, don't give me people. And it's uh, it's very funny because uh, the work which I do today is almost entirely dealing with people and helping people actually get better at dealing with other people. Uh, so that that's the, the curve of my story. That's the arc which my story has taken. And what led me to that is the first time I became a manager. I think this is across the technology industry. People are promoted to management because they are good at something else, not at management. Yes. And I, I was in a managerial position and I tried to use the same, uh, like the the, progr- the programming analogy with, uh, with people. I, I started to say things and I expected them to behave in a certain way. And then people don't behave like computers, if you push buttons, people, uh, everybody reacts differently. Uh, so uh, after a couple of years of being a terrible manager and uh, having nobody to learn from, nobody, nowhere to go to, I was recommended by a very respected family friend to to uh, go and attend a few leadership development programs. And it, it, it was a three-day program and it stretched on to two years because I found it so fascinating because I, I think I was 25 or 26 at that that time. And I, I, I was learning something totally new. I, like I, I thought I had learned a lot about the world. I was a avid book reader. I used to read everything, but I never read about people. I never read about psychology. I never read about why people behave the way they do. And uh, after that, uh, I, I thought that if I can do, if I can become a better leader at work, what else can I do? And that led me to starting a couple of companies of my own. Then I dabbled into activism. Like, like uh, I organized an anti-corruption march uh, back when I was in India. And then I started an NGO, ran it for two years. And ever since I, I have been fascinated by this question that uh, like what, who are we as human beings and what, what all are we capable of? Because we, I, I think that we sell ourselves too short or we undersell ourselves, especially in the technology world, 
when when I hear people speak like like I'm only good at this or I can't talk to business people, I can't talk to marketing people. Uh, so that's the crux of my journey. Today I, I run a coaching program called Deploy Yourself, where I help uh, people from from across industry, mostly from the tech industry because that's where my background is. Uh, but from across industries to to become better leaders and to become better at what they what they do and and communication and dealing with people is is the crux of it. Yeah, absolutely. I think uh, you know when you're talking about dealing with people and. You know, I was in the same boat as you, where it's kind of like, just leave me alone, let me code you. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, but but I found that building leadership kind of gets you that same. Um, uh, well, it's, it's even more of a rush than you know than writing you know good code because you, you know when you write good code, you have software that people use, and I think that's the whole um, you know joy that you get from writing code is that you you built something yourself. But when you can you know change a person's life or help someone grow, and, and you get that same kind of um, I don't know if it's a dopamine rush or, or what it is, but you get that, that same kind of enjoyment of seeing someone else succeed. Exactly. Yeah, I, I would call it more of an enjoyment or a satisfaction than than like a high. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> uh, because for me, it it lasts. It's, it gives me moments to remember. Because I right. still remember when people have come to me and said that, like that one conversation changed my life. Also, you, do, you didn't have to do that. Like those words, a few sentences are worth more than like anything like a promotion or a monetary award. At least for me, it gives me long standing satisfaction. So how is it that you made that shift? Like, um, you know, you're writing code, you get into management, you're managing, you know, a team of people and you, 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 you know, shocks you that it's different, right? It's, it's not the same thing, you, you, you know, and we, we always go through that where, you know, you're good at, let's say, uh, you know, writing JavaScript and now you're managing JavaScript people. That's a totally different skill set. Um, when you get into that and you start, start studying psychology, start studying how, the, how um, communication is important and how to motivate people, um, what, what was it that made you decide that, you know, this is, this is what I'm going to spend my, the rest of my life doing? Yeah, yeah. I, I think I started with a sense of frustration because mm -hmm. uh, what happened when I started uh, managing people, people were not responding and then my team mm -hmm. was not performing as I had expected because I was a star performer and then I wanted everybody to be a star performer. And uh, like if, if you know uh, like the what, what, what that means, it can, can create a toxic environment. It can create an environment where people... Uh, are not performing because not because they are bad performers but because you have created an environment because being seen as a failure or being seen as average or ordinary is is not okay yeah right and, and I, have, I had no idea i was doing so uh, so that frustration led me to sign up for that leadership dealership development course which mm -hmm. uh, which i mentioned and then as part of that course i was um, i was assigned a coach i had a coach for a couple of years uh, and and then once I started uh, understanding how people react, the way people behave, what are some of those foundational elements? And and um, oh, one of them is emotions. Like um, I had never heard about emotions uh, in my formal education. I think it's still never there in the formal schooling and business education. Uh, but I started uh, to learn about emotions. First of all, my own emotions, like how my emotions show up, what are they trying to tell me, and then how to deal with somebody else's emotions because people get emotions. And then uh, one of the biggest discoveries or like insights which I've had is that um, people make decisions because of emotions, not not because of logical thinking. Uh, and emotions is the is the deciding factor when you, whenever we, we make, we choose one choice over the other. Uh, so emotions play a big part of uh, what I do today, how I work with leaders. So do you think um, when it comes to emotions, there, there's some people that I've worked with and, um, that, that are very in tune with their emotions and they understand them. They, they know what they're feeling. And there's other people that, that struggle to understand what they're actually feeling and, and what these emotions mean and what calls them. Um, is, is that a skill that can be learned? And, and if so, what are some things that we can do to maybe uh, get more in tune with what we're feeling? Yes. So absolutely. This is a skill just like any other skill, which can be learned. I think our current state of emotional intelligence comes from, the environment we have grown up in, the kind of family we have grown up in, the kind of culture we have grown up in, what, what was acceptable, what was not acceptable. Like to give you an example, in many cultures, it's not acceptable for men to cry. Mm -hmm. It's not acceptable uh, for women to shout. Like it, it's, it's just seen uh, as, as bad. 
so people shut up that side of their of their emotional side not because they don't want to because because they have not known any other way and so where people are in terms of their current emotional intelligence is mostly governed by how they have grown up and the kind of environment they have lived in yeah so however, oh go yeah. ahead sorry about that. yeah yeah however one thing which i have learned is is that like we we use these words easy and difficult like we we use uh, difficult conversations as a it's it's a phrase that every time business people have to deal with techies it's a difficult conversation and the other way around as well like if i have if i am a techie and i have to give a presentation to my ceo i have no idea what words to use and then that makes it a difficult conversation and most techies are introverts so any kind of conflict or any kind of disagreements uh, can turn into a difficult conversation mm-hmm. and and the thing which i was pointing to is that easy and difficult is not a function of the conversation easy and difficult is a function of practice so any skill if you practice it will become easy or it will move from being difficult to being easy so when when i say that i am not good at emotions or emotions are difficult for me i am not describing the emotions i am describing my skill so whenever people use this word easy and difficult for me it's a it's a clear indicator that they have not had practice in that area and i have seen people i have seen myself and i have seen people have conversations very easily which few years ago they would they would call them as a as a difficult conversation Yeah no I think you're absolutely right and you know you see that with um with everything like you know I have kids and when kids are first learning a sport they'll say you know dribbling a basketball is hard but the more they practice it becomes like second nature and then it becomes easy you know then, then basketball becomes easy and uh you know the same thing happened with um you know one of my one of my um one of my employees where they're talking about how like doing uh one-on-ones were hard they were uncomfortable it was difficult to do a one-on-one with someone but then after you do those for a while they become like second nature it just becomes you you get in the habit of doing those good things and and things that were difficult before when you get practice become easy there was a book um I, th- I think i first heard about it from a ted talk where a guy did like 100 days of re- rejection where he tried to get rejected 100 times to help or, or 100 days in a row to help build his uh ability to ask for things because he was so nervous to go for an ask you know to ask for anything that he would just you know crumble and just not do it so he said i'm going to ask for the craziest things for 100 days in a row and he would go to people's houses and just say he would just say hey can i uh play in your backyard <laughs> this is like you know a 40 year old man going asking how play in your backyard it sounds so weird because he he wanted to get that rejection to get used to rejection and make make accepting you know negative feedback um um easy like you're saying instead of difficult exactly so every i think everything <clears throat> related to leadership is a skill and and i have i have uh, heard of this uh, this man's story which you're mentioning mm-hmm. uh, and asking like asking for what you want is is a huge area for for techies i think where they can step up yeah because many times i have what i have found is people in emotions like um, anger frustration or even resentment because somebody else is not doing what what they want them to do and when i ask them that have you have you actually gone out to them and made a request they said no because either it's an expectation which they should understand or or because they they are scared or they are, it's, it's a too too much of a difficult conversation but asking for what you want is is so it's such a simple skill right it's a, such a simple skill it's but it's so critical and people often miss that mm-hmm. yeah no i agree 100% i think um you know we need to work even if you're not like a manager in tech maybe you're just a um I don't say just <laughs> maybe maybe you're a developer or um someone in QA or someone in a, a project manager you still need to build those skills and uh, working on those and practicing building those skills will help you out you know even if you don't get into to, to a management type role they still help you out as being a leader on your team at whatever level you're in um what are some things that we can do to maybe build some of those skills um on our own yeah i think exactly what you, what you shared right leadership is is not about the title which is which is management everybody even if you're a developer you can show up as a leader in in mm-hmm. what you're doing right and, and one th- i think one very critical skill since you asked this question right what what can people do to show up as a leader or to build up their leadership skills is to zoom out from whatever whatever that current topic is or the current uh, problem is or the challenge is and ask and then focus on the team so f- instead of focusing on let's say one person or a project 
focus on the team and then ask yourself what is it that will make the team successful what is it that will make my department or my company successful and then within that context how do we talk right because people can get lost in the in the conversation and they can like they can get into a fist fight they can they can get into an argument and what happens in that that they get into a myopic point of view where they forget the reason why they are doing what they're doing for the in the first place yes yeah. yeah so bringing that awareness into the day to day activity bring the, bringing the big picture into the day to day activity and it's simple question right what is what is my team here for a team is always there for a particular purpose and if your conversation whether it's a like a wonderful laughing conversation or whether you are fighting whether it's a conflict it's a conversation with friction if you are not if that conversation is not helping the team achieve what it is supposed to be there for you are missing out on something and connecting and what what is happening on the ground to what the purpose of a team is is leadership it is is like one way to remind people that that's what, that's why we are here so that that's uh, one one skill which i would uh, think anybody can build irrespective of their title yeah no i, I agree 100% i think that's that's you know that's why i'm doing this podcast right it's to help people build that skill and i think that's a um, a super important one um one of the things that I think runs adjacent kind of to that leadership is um, is communication. We have to have good communication skills to be um, a good leader. Um, what are some some things that we need to pay attention to when we're communicating? Because a lot of people think just the words that they write down or the words they say is what's important, but isn't there a lot more behind that than just the words they say? Absolutely. So for me, leadership begins with listening, and mm-hmm. any communication begins with listening. Yes. And what I what I mean by that is that. When somebody is talking, right, when we are using a certain words or certain sounds, there is a lot more behind that, which is much more powerful than the words than the content, which we miss out of. So when I when I when I say listening, if we can actually listen not for the words, not for the words being so uh, being spoken, but but the why behind it, like what is the story behind it? Why is this person suddenly acting this way? Whether they are joyful or whether they are frustrated what what is causing them to if we can listen to that and then speak to that so let's say let's say somebody is um is having a moment of frustration in front of me so i can talk to the frustration or i can say i see that you are frustrated tell me what happened so i don't address what the person is uh, saying literally in words but i go deep i say that i sense an emotion which is frustration and i and i say that Tell me more. Why are you frustrated? What is it that you care about? What what needs to happen that is not happening? And then talk about that. So you you don't talk about the content. You talk about something deeper. And listening is the first step to do so. Yeah. No, I, I agree 100. percent I think sometimes we we as leaders feel like we have to be the ones monopolizing the conversation as far as doing all the talking and you know and that as a leader we have to be directing, but you know, the real leaders are the ones that sit quietly and listen and understand first and then, you know, offer advice and input and mentorship um, after after they've listened and learned. And, and I think that's, that's kind of the next step after you've listened, you got to learn a little bit before you can, you know, get in there and start directing. Um, um, what, what are some other things that when it comes into um to, to being a good leader that we need to focus on? We've talked about emotions and communication and listening. Um, what are some other areas that, that are important there? I think when a very powerful skill, especially in the current age, especially in the 21st century, is coaching. And um, if you ask me, coaching is just a way of communicating. Mm-hmm. We can we can get all specific about coaching. We can we can we can, we can like 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 me. I'm doing coaching as a profession, so I've gone much deeper. But but to put it very simply, coaching is a skill where I show somebody the mirror, and have that person figure out what is missing for themselves rather than me telling them rather than me giving an advice or a suggestion or a like or, or a directive uh, that's what coaching is and it happens in in conversations through questioning and through reflection from a mood of curiosity from a mood of uh, mood of openness uh, so coaching as a skill and what enables coaching is that mood of curiosity that mood of openness and learning which i found so often missing in organizations uh, without which coaching as a as a skill or as a technique will not work if you do not have that mood of openness and learning. 
Yeah. I think a lot of managers want to just tell people what to do instead of teach them, you know, what, you, you know, and when it comes to coaching, I think it's very important. What you said is that, you know, they have to learn for themselves, right? You have to show them the way where there's, and I found that you know, with kids, it works the same way, right? If you tell your kids, Hey, don't do this. They're probably going to end up doing it anyway. But if you show them like what the consequences are for doing this, you know, it, it, like if you stay up late, you're going to feel bad when you wake up in the morning, right? So, so you show them that and they learn, oh, I can't just stay up late if I have to get up early. And, and they kind of learn that over time by experience. And, you know, that's one of the things that when you are a leader or manager of a team, you've got to coach them by giving them experience in one way or another. You know, you have to not, not just tell them to do this thing, not have them do things for you, but let them learn by trying trial and error, let them fail, let them you know, you know, develop. And I think coaching's one of the easy ways to, to, that people can kind of learn um, without, you know, dire consequences. Exactly. I think, I think you're spot on with the, with the analogy of uh, kids. I have a two-year-old son, so I can totally relate to that. Mm -hmm. And this is one of the things which I've learned about human beings, whether, whether they are children or whether they are managers or techies or whoever, that when you push people, they, they will push back. People want to be autonomous. Like this is, this is, the basic human tendency that we want autonomy in what we are doing. We do not want people telling us what to do. Right. And giving advice or giving a directive is basically telling somebody what to do. And whenever you do so, there will be a pushback. It might be a visible pushback or it might be an invisible pushback where somebody might be saying something, but inside themselves, they are not putting it out there. Right. So that's uh, that's something which I, which I say that if you are in a directive culture, if you are in a culture where uh, managers actually tell people what to do, and th there is a place, there is, there is a place where that makes sense, but in most of the cases, it's not the, it is not, it's not the case. But if you are in that kind of a culture, you will get obedience and you can get compliance, but you will not get creativity, you will not get innovation, you will not get, not get the brainstorming of ideas. Uh, so that's how I separate out uh, directive, like directive as a, as a way of leadership, and then coaching. Or being more indirect as a, as a leadership skill. Yeah, no, I think you're spot on there. And there are times where you know you don't, you, you might not need the innovation and creativity. And, and I'll give you an example. Like if you're um, in the middle of a crisis, right? If you're you're you know um, have to execute your disaster recovery plan because maybe there's um, uh, a, a building that's you know destroyed, or maybe it's a ransomware attack or something like that, and you have to. You, you know, you're, you're in a crisis. Well, we don't need creativity and innovation at that point. We need to follow the plan, right? We need to execute. And, and But once we're past that, and then we want to improve in the future, then that's when we need, you know, that more coaching, you know, and less of the directive. And, and there is a time and place for everything. But I think you're right. I think in normal day-to-day -day business is typically more of the innovative and creativity that we're looking for. And you're right. We don't get that just by telling people what to do. Exactly right, and even in in that crisis or emergency situations, that directive style falls under a context that because there is an emergency or because there is something which I need to mitigate immediately, I am switching to this style. And you can you can be open about it, right? You can say that look mm -hmm. look man, like this is this is the situation right now. We have to get it get it out within like as soon as possible. So I'm going to do this. I'm going to dictate. I'm going to like be on your on on your on your, on my toes and keep you on your toes. But once this is over, like this, let's have, let's come back to the default state. Another, another reason, right? Another reason to actually be more directive is when, when you do not trust somebody's performance or somebody uh, has been yes. acting behind, right? But instead of directly going into the directive state, you can say that, see, this is your previous performance. I, I'm missing a little bit of trust here. So I'm going to step in. I'm going to zoom in and work closely with you to support you to do well. As soon as you feel that you are ready, ask me to back out, like ask me to fuck off, ask me to step away, right? Because that's not what I want to do. I, right. I will do it to help you become better. Right. So. Put yeah. I think what you're talking about there is, is transparency really, you know, that the, the leader needs to be transparent about when they're stepping in and why they're stepping in and that there's an opportunity for them to step back out. Is that what you're saying? Exactly, exactly, right? So transparency about why we are doing what we are doing, right? Why mm -hmm. am I doing this? Just letting people know that this is not who I am. This is not just what I believe in, but this is the reason that I am switching to this style and then I will switch back. 
Yeah, no, I think you're absolutely right. I think transparency is one of those things that uh, I don't know if it's like large corporations <laughs> kind of calls us to feel like we can't share as much when we become a manager or if it's, uh, you know, because there, there are a lot of guidelines. There's a lot of things you're not supposed to talk about, right? You know, when it comes to like HIPAA and employee salaries and things like that, you're not supposed to share that kind of stuff. So we feel like we're, we, we can't share our own stuff either. And sometimes we're not as transparent with people with what we're doing because we kind of blur those lines of what is acceptable and what's not acceptable. I know, like for me, when I first became a manager, I kind of felt like I couldn't talk to my peers anymore, even though we were, you know, we, we were developers together just a few months ago. Now I'm a manager. I feel like I can't, can't be their friend anymore, you know, but that's not the case. I, I can, I just got to learn what's on, what's off limits and what, what is not off limits. And, you know, about me, I, I'm welcome to share what I need to share, you know, and tell them, Hey, I'm not good at this. And, but I felt like before I couldn't do that because, you know, now I'm a manager. I can't tell them what I'm weak at, what I, what I need help at. Um, but I think offering that transparency, once I learned that I can do that and I can be transparent with them and I can't tell them why I'm, like you said, stepping in when it, when it, I feel like it's necessary and give them the ability, Hey, you can be transparent back and you can tell me why I shouldn't be stepping in <laughs> and let's talk about it. Let's have that conversation. And, you know, one-on-ones help me with that. Um, have you seen that with your, with your work as well? Yes, absolutely. Right. I think, I think the, the risk we take by not being transparent is we allow people to create stories in, in their heads and, and then they will operate from their stories rather than what we think is the right information or the, or the facts about the situation. And that is very dangerous because then people will start reacting. People will start uh, showing up in emotional states because of what they believe in or because of what they think might be happening. And because you have withholds, withheld some information or some policy because of whatever reasons you have. And, and I think what causes that is, is a fundamental distrust in people, a fundamental distrust in seeing the person who is working with you as your peer. Right? Because if, if, you are, if you are seeing somebody as a peer, if you trust them, why would you hide some, something from them? Right. And, and I, I think that's a fundamental mistrust, especially in large organizations because because yes there are a lot of moving parts there are there's a lot of risk there which can which can happen uh, but at the same time the cost of not being transparent is so huge which people do not realize yeah i think i think sometimes people i don't know there's this old old mindset where people feel like somebody's trying to they're out to get them right you know someone's out to, out to get your job so you don't trust them um but i don't know i, I feel like you know if you want to grow as a leader you want to have a high performing team then you've got to have trust and you want people to outperform you. You know, um, I, I don't know. I feel like that's some, one of the things that people struggle with. Yeah. And, and just being open about it, right? If somebody mm -hmm. is doing well, celebrating it out in the open with the whole entire team shows that, right? If somebody outperforms you, if somebody did something better than you as a leader, that's not a place to recoil in your, in your like comfort zone. That's a place to come out, be vulnerable and, Acknowledge that, okay, you did this, I learned this from you. But that's that's how you lead by example. Yeah, I know for me sometimes I'm, and, and maybe I go too far the other direction. Sometimes I'm self-deprecating. I talk about how like I'm not good at something. And um, and, and I think the reason why I do it is I don't want to come off with an, high, with an ego. You know, I don't want to come off um, as being uh, all-knowing at work. You know, so I try to do the opposite. Uh, Sometimes I try to you know talk about how I'm not good at this. Someone says better at this, and, and I don't know. Sometimes maybe maybe I do that too far. Have you seen where leaders kind of take it too far sometimes? And if so, what can we do to fix that without becoming an egomaniac or something? Yeah, I, th I think it's a it's a fine line. It's a fine line. So if I if I like uh, believe too much in myself, I can be overconfident and cocky. Uh, but at the same time, if I lack self belief, I can discredit discredit myself even when others see me as good in a particular skill. A yeah. domain uh, and it's always treading that uh, fine line so if you if you are confident about a certain skill if you have feedback to prove that then there is nothing there is nothing ego tripping to talk about it or, yeah. or to say or to say basically that i am good at it and this is my strength at the same time you can always be open to feedback which which uh, like proves otherwise uh, and then listen to those in, and actually invite feedback, right? One thing which I, which I recommend leaders is to ask their leaders, uh, ask their people to tell them what they would not usually tell them on, the, on their face, right? So bring out those conversations which are happening behind them in the open. 
right? So, and you have to deliberately ask for them by saying that, like, tell me, I want to hear this because I want to improve. And I assure you that there will be no negative consequences or there will be, this has nothing to do with team performance. This is only for my own self growth and learning. So once you do so, you do not allow ego to play a part because ego plays a part even when you do not ask for feedback. Yeah. Even when you do not ask for feedback, it's, it's your ego playing a part there. Does, does that make sense, John? Yeah, it does. And, and you know, and one of the things I wanted to add to that is when you're um, asking for that tough feedback, sometimes people don't want to give it to you. <laughs> Actually, they never want to give it to you um, when you're their boss. Um, one of the things that I found is helpful for me is to try to get um, tr try to get us on a level playing field somewhere. So like doing it um, in your office is not a good good place to, to do that, to ask for feedback because you're already, you know, you're in your area, right? It's like you have home court advantage. You want to do it like outside on a walk, um, in a more neutral setting if you can, um, uh, in a way that, and not to be defensive. Don't say anything in response of why you, you know, if someone gives you negative feedback, don't ever say, well, this is why, no, don't defend yourself at all. You have to get to the point where you listen to that negative feedback and say, thank you, and that's it. And, you know, if you if you have things you want to say later, go back, write it down, <laughs> you know, but don't don't just, you know, respond. I think that's one of the things that leaders say, well, I asked for feedback, but then when you gave them feedback, you immediately, you know, told them why that their opinion of your feedback was wrong, <laughs> you know, you defended it. And I think that's that's where people mess up. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, and uh, and this reminds me of uh, of the importance of our physical state or or the or the way mm. we are present physically, right? Because you talked yes. about the office, uh, but one thing which I learned to have effective one on ones is to have walking one on ones. Yes. But I would walk out outside of the office. I would walk amidst amidst nature, amidst uh, where there is some water, where there is a fresh air, and that allows me to have very different conversations. Because first of all, you are not sitting across across a table facing each other that immediately creates an adversarial position right subconsciously when we are sitting across a table facing each other that puts us against each other when we are walking we are walking in the same direction and we don't sometimes we don't think that these little things make a difference but they make a huge difference so whenever people are fighting whenever people are, are in conflict one advice which i give them is to stop sitting on opposite sides of the table either come to the whiteboard where you face the whiteboard together as a team, or you come on the same side of the table and then do something on a pen and paper. Just having this subtle change in your physical surroundings has a huge impact on our mood, has a huge impact on how we see each other's words and communication, whether it is adversarial or whether it is something which we are doing together. So we want people to fight a problem. We want people to find it, fight an issue, not to fight each other. And the role, the physical surroundings, uh, another fascinating example I can share, right? A few, I think it was a few months ago, I was coaching uh, one senior senior leader in a, in, a, in a big tech company. And uh, the complaint he had was that he, he's feeling depressive. He's feeling like, uh, like his bosses are rubbing him the wrong way. He can't trust anybody. Uh, and this was, uh, this was when COVID was there and everything was virtual. And I asked him, Tell me, tell me about your physical surrounding. Tell me where are you working most of these days? And he, he told me that I am working in a basement where there is no natural light, where it's, uh, it's uh, totally dark, where there is no fresh air. And the one shift which I suggested to him that he move his working space near a window, near a place where he can see something on the outside. And without doing anything, within a couple of weeks, he said that he is feeling better. So, we don't see this, but our physical surroundings has a huge impact on the way we feel, the way we react, the way we listen to people, and the way we communicate. Yeah, no, I think you're absolutely right. I think you know, physicality is really important. And I remember during COVID, um, um, doing one on ones, and you know, it, it wasn't cool because I was I was also in a basement <laughs> as well without any windows, you know. Uh, trying to do my one on ones at that point, and someone suggested to me that I should, you know, do it on my phone and just walk around the neighborhood. And I thought, hmm, let me try that. And I had my employees do that too. It's like when we did a one on one, we could get on our phone and just walk around the neighborhood and talk to each other. And you know, that changed, you know, uh, it, it kind of made us feel like we we're back in the office again, back doing the one on ones where we're walking around the pond, you know. And it also just getting outside in nature, breathing in that fresh air, um, and not being confined to a basement. <laughs> um, made us both a little bit more open and a little bit easier to communicate. 
exactly yeah i think that's so, a huge element which we which we tend to miss yeah so, so tell me what is uh what is it like to um to be coached by you so like if i go to deployyourself.com i fill out the contact form and i and i want to i want to get coached uh, what's that process like what, what's the experience like yeah yeah so so we start with the where do you want to be in the future and that we are talking about a long term future mm-hmm. what do you want to be different and and this is only in the context of leadership so what somebody might want to be different is like i want to produce better business results i want to improve the performance of my team or i want to be able to b- communicate better or i want to be able to listen better so we start with with an objective which is there in the future and then we come back to the person and see that what is it that is missing in this person because again most of the people i'm i'm coaching are very successful and uh, are coming from a track record of like um, promotion after promotion or one company after another company but what they see is that after a certain time the strengths which they had at one point of time is actually becoming a blocker for them to move ahead in their in their career so whatever they have tried and worked in the past is not working anymore and then they need to shift who they are rather than what they, what they are doing on a day to day basis and that's where our coaching focus is on that who do you need to be to create the kind of results right so again earlier we were talking about zooming in and zooming out yeah so my coaching works on the zoom out level like my work coaching will address what are the results that you want to produce so we will zoom in into the results and then we will zoom out and say who is the leader that you want to be that who you need to be to produce these results and much more in fact one challenge which i sometimes throw through to people is that like pick a number pick a number whatever results you want to create put it into numbers and then multiply that number by 10x and let's work let's create that the context of our coaching because what is stopping the person from putting a 10x number in the first place is something which is limiting them and once we start working towards that whether they hit 2x or 3x or 5x is immaterial in the end but who they become as a leader who they become as a person is 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 such a shift from where we started and um, we're talking about a long term journey so most of my coaching clients are working with me for 6 months or or a one, or a year year long program uh, so over this duration right whatever targets you achieve whatever goals you achieve whether it's uh, 1x 2x or 5x that, that is immaterial but who you pick up that's the real product of of my coaching that's the real output of my coaching is is the who you become how you transform yourself how you shift your personality and your skills as a leader and then by extension you can create the results which you want to create in your life yeah no i love that i think that's great i think that um you know realizing that you've changed as a person is the important part um not the not the job title that has changed or anything like that i think uh i think that's where you're you're um getting the most bang for your buck there yes exactly So how can people connect with you and find out more about the things that you're doing? People can find me on LinkedIn. Um I'm I'm there most active on LinkedIn. I also have a newsletter which I send out every every couple of weeks uh which uh, people can find me on deployyourself.com/newsletter. Uh and um, I I share about uh, how people are more powerful than they think they they are. Right? Because I I do not I do not do anything for my coaches <laughs> let me clarify right i help them see what they already have i help them see the power which they already have like this is one of my fundamental beliefs like i am not helping somebody i am not fixing somebody i am helping people see where they are powerful which they do not currently realize and once people realize that they will naturally as a natural extension of who they are they will go out and perform Right. so i am there as a catalyst i am there as a, as a support structure uh, and it's 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 people who do the magic right i'm i'm not doing anything right? and something which i say is that my the real coaching does not happen in the coaching session which we do the real coaching happens out there when you apply what you learned in the coaching in your real life that's where the real coaching happens if you apply what what we talk about in in our like once every two weeks sessions you will get transformative results that's where the real coaching is happening but if you do not apply then just sitting together for one hour every week or every two weeks will not make any difference mm-hmm. so so that's how i i see people right Pe- people i think people are much more powerful than they give themselves credit for uh, and uh, that's that's hugely satisfying for me to help somebody see that
Yeah, no, I think that's awesome. And um, I want to link that up in the show notes to your LinkedIn and to deploy yourself.com so people can find that at geekleader.com. And uh, again, thanks so much for coming on the show. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, John, for having me. If you enjoyed that episode, please uh, leave a rating and review in Apple Podcasts. I'd greatly appreciate that. And also, don't forget to check out merch. We have some T-shirts that uh, I've designed that are on at geekleader.com. Um, you can click on the merchandise uh, section there and check that out. And also, don't forget about the books from our guests. So if you like this guest and other guests that have written books, please um, go ahead and check that out at geekleader.com. I would greatly appreciate it, and I'm sure they would too.